So please join me in welcoming Dr. Manny McGuire. So that's fine. It's taken a while. Um, and what I'm going to do because of that is kind of give a lot more background information about this group of studies and how it kind of comes from some of my way early work. Um, so actually some of the work I did with Kathy in graduate school and quickly go through that and then kind of move it up to what we're doing now. So we're looking at the EEG correlates of word learning, and a lot of this work is actually work from Allison Abel, who is the postdoc working with me. This is a lot of our collaborative work. So I'll kind of talk about that and how these studies were created. A whole bunch of background and a little bit of data. So, um, okay, so that's kind of my overview of the talk. I'm gonna kind of go through this background interest in word learning, some of the early studies that I've done. Specifically, the initial interest was looking at nouns compared to verbs. And in theory, that moved into the EEG stuff, but it didn't work that well. Um, and then kind of how Allison and I started taking some of this stuff to design this EEG study with much older kids and looking at word learning in a very different way than I had done previously. Um, so I'm going to talk a lot about that study, how this study was created. And I'm going to kind of go through how the study has changed over time. So we've been submitting for different grants over time. And with the feedback and the pilot data that we create, we've been sort of shifting what the question is. So this is also kind of an overview on the idea that research changes and takes a really long time. So <laughs> nice to, to know going into it um, since Ellison left <laughs> this year and, you know, is now gone for a few months and we're still just getting data. So it's, this is the way it works. Welcome to research graduate students. Um, that's why some of us look like this. Yeah. <laughs> it takes a really long time. Um, Bottoming out. Okay, so I did a lot of my graduate work with Kathy Hirsch-Pasek at Temple University and when I first started there, there was a lot of interest in, she was doing a lot of different studies on how children learn nouns, and specifically how you attach a noun label to an object that's in front of you. So for example, we would show or have a kid play with something like a juicer, kitchen items are great for this, and say something like, look, it's a modi, it's a modi, it's a modi, and there are all different variations of this. We could show four different colored objects like this. You can change the material. I can point to the object or just look at the object. I can hold the object. The kid can play with it, change the syntax. All different variations on this. And then what you do after labeling it a certain amount of times is, especially what we did is use a looking time paradigm where a variation of that object comes up along with some other object and the question is, can the child find the modi? We say, look at the modi, do they do that? This one was actually looking at parts of objects, so if they notice the handle or not compared to other pieces of the object, we obviously change the color. And across all of these studies, what we find is that kids are really, really good at this. So learning a noun label and applying it to an object that's in the environment, they're great at. So by about 12 months, 14 months, depending on how easy you make it, they're really good at looking to the target item. You can make it a lot harder by not letting them touch it and only using eye gaze, making one really interesting compared to the one they have to learn. But for the most part, they're really good at this. So soon after I got to, to Temple, we, Kathy had just been funded for a large grant to switch from looking at nouns to looking at verbs. And verbs are, for one, much more difficult than nouns when it comes to how children acquire them and the types of information that they encode. But they're essential to language. Every language has, every language has nouns and verbs. Every language requires verbs to have a sentence. So in English, we cannot have a sentence without a verb, and that's true of all languages. So it really is what gives us a lot of the productivity of language. Um, children are pretty bad at this. They're bad at this across languages, but they do better in some languages than others. There are semantic and syntactic reasons for why. Obviously, syntactically, verbs are much more complex. You have transitives, intransitives, a bunch of variations. I'm more interested in the semantics. So what makes them difficult semantically are just that perceptually they look really different. So if you even take a really simple verb like running, a dog running, my grandmother running, and an Olympian running all look totally different from each other. So how does a child figure out what fits within the category of running compared to what doesn't, right? So that skipping is not running. How do they learn those classifications? Um, and really the first question was to take this from something as close to what we were doing with noun learning to move it to verb learning. 
So the initial study was exactly like what we were doing with nouns, but doing this in video. So we would have people perform actions, and I'm not going to show the videos of this because it humiliates them every time, but these were people, <laughs> this is the other thing, this is from graduate school, this poor girl is an assistant professor somewhere and I still show these videos of her, so this is her. Um, but basically she's doing an action like this and we say, look, she's blicking, she's blicking, she's blicking, and then we show another person doing it, she's also a professor at Florida International, um, and then you get two new people and on, they're totally different people on one side, there's someone doing the same action, on the other side there's someone doing a very, very different action. And in this case we have arm movements compared to leg movements. Same question, when we ask, you know, where is blicking, can they do it? And we knew that kids were worse at this, so we started with kids who are about 16 months of age, I think, or 18 months. And we actually found they couldn't look significantly longer at the target. This is looking time to the target item compared to non-target item. So we did 24 month olds, didn't work. 30 month olds, didn't work. Again, this is about three years of my graduate school career, so <laughs> they, don't, they don't do this. They just can't do it. And there's a couple of reasons why, but this didn't work at all. So we made a couple of changes to it, including older kids and then moving the training from four people to just one person. So instead of having four different people and then a new person do the test trial, we had one person and then a new person in the test trial. And that actually made a huge difference. So even with the 30-month-olds and the 36-month-olds, and now we're talking about three-year-olds, like this is old for learning verbs. They're at chance levels when there's four different people, but when you have one person, they actually do pretty well. So what we learned from this is that verb learning is pretty different from noun learning. It's not the same thing. It is much, much harder for kids to do, even when the action is right in front of them and incredibly simple. It lear it's learned much later, and we really think they're using different strategies. So for nouns, when you have multiple exemplars, that helps you. Having multiple different colors of an object will help you learn that object and extend it to something else. For actions, it seems to be somewhat different. That actually having the same thing over and over again gets you familiar enough with the item to then pay attention to the action, and that that's more helpful for verbs. So I'm going through this because we're going to figure out that a lot of this stuff ends up playing a role in what we started to do with later word learning. So this was my main interest in graduate school and moving beyond graduate school, um, but I did my postdoc looking at ERPs. So looking at ERPs, event-related potentials, we're looking at changes in the electrophysiology in kids to see what I thought would be good was things like where we had kids looking at a target compared to a non-target, we could also look at how their brain is responding instead of looking at looking times. And that might tell us whether things match or don't match and how they're learning the labels. So during my postdoc, I was actually in a um, huge longitudinal study on reading. So I didn't get to do a lot of the studies I wanted to do. I learned a ton, but it wasn't necessarily <laughs> able to kind of start looking at noun and verb learning. Um, once I started here, I was like, okay, now I'm going to try to do these same studies. And what I had been looking at was what we call word-to-world mapping, right? You hear a word, and the referent for that word is somewhere in the environment. It's either an object that's in front of you, it's an action that's in front of you, it's something that you can label, you can see it. You can see the referent in front of you. And this became a real problem. I did lots and lots of variations trying to study this, but there is an inherent temporal aspect to verbs. Verbs take place over time. ERPs are really, really sensitive to time differences. So there is no way to match the visual understanding of an object to an action like running, because running is gonna take even the shortest period of time, a couple milliseconds to figure out. But by that time, the ERP has changed. It's, it's not consistent. So when it came to actually teaching verbs and nouns and looking at learning for world to word mapping, I just couldn't do it. I spent years trying to figure out how to test this and never found a way that really, to me, seemed like it was effectively testing the questions that I had. So for a long time I did a lot of kind of side projects, not really side projects, but other projects looking at semantic processing more generally. So anyone who was here when Mike Motes spoke last time, he was talking about some work we had done with um, semantic processing and inhibition. And that wasn't, you know, it's not word learning anymore, but I could still look at semantic processing. I also did some studies looking at adult and, ad and child object and action identification. And this one I'm just gonna go through pretty quickly, but it shows how the ERPs can kind of work more effectively for this. The question wasn't how do kids learn 
nouns and verbs, but how do they process nouns and verbs that they already know the meanings to? So in this case, we had something where we have a fixation point, and all of this were collecting EEG data at the same time. So you're wearing a cap, you look at a fixation point, and then you hear a word, like dog, and then you see a picture, and the picture either matches the word or does not match the word. Does this match or not match? Can everyone tell me? That's a match, yes. So we have a dog, right? And in the pictures, I had very clear actions as well as clear objects. So you could label the object, and these actions were actually, these cards were created um, specifically to test people with aphasia who have problems with, with labeling actions. So they were very, very clearly defined to show actions. So we could either have a noun that matched, or we could have a verb that matched, like give. Um, and we had matches, non-matches. And what we were doing is actually comparing how quickly and how efficiently adults and children could make that match. When you have a noun to a picture with an object in it compared to a verb that has an action in it, can you identify that as quickly and easily? Does that make sense? So I'm not gonna go through the specific ERP results, but the end result was, we, we actually piloted this looking at eight and nine year olds with the idea that eventually we would look at much younger kids. And it actually turned out that eight and nine year olds were all still different from adults in verb processing. So the general finding was that even eight and nine year olds were actually slower at identifying that action than they were at identifying the object. And adults showed no difference. So we got into some of the, there's actually an N300 and 400 in these T's apart and what they mean semantically. But um, children are still kind of not as good at their verb identification. And, it, and the belief is that they don't have as solid of a representation of verbs. So if I hear a word like give, I may only have one or two variations of what give should look like. And then if something matches or doesn't match, I'm not as good and as flexible at identifying that quickly as if I have a really solid representation of it. So this was the type of work I was doing. I can answer any questions about that one. but. I actually presented this work at a um, Boston Language Conference a few years back, and it turned out that Alison Abel was at the conference, and we started talking because she was really, really interested in verb learning and trying to find ways to use EEG to study nouns and verbs. So um, she ended up, we had talked for a while, and she ended up applying for the Calier postdoc and getting that position. So we started working on this collaboration to study noun and verb learning in older kids. So most of her interest is really in um, children with specific language impairment. And we had talked about that one the other week too. So specific language impairment, you know, kids are showing impairments that they shouldn't necessarily show based on their um, intellectual abilities and other reasons. So children seem to really struggle with verbs a lot more with specific language impairment. And so this has been a question that she has. I was interested in verbs for other reasons. So when she started her postdoc here, we decided to try to create a new way of studying this and actually looking at noun and verb learning in kids. Um, compared to what I had been doing previously, though, we made a couple of changes. So one was to look at older kids. Um, one is the age group that I want to look at, which is like three and five year olds are exactly at the age where they can grab an EEG net and they pull it really hard. And those cost like $1,800 each. So that, the moving away from that age group wasn't that painful. Um, <laughs> there was also the idea of avoiding video. So this idea of actions taking place over time, you, it, it really is insurmountable at this point for us to find a way to do word to world mapping with this. And we also wanted to find a study that had been previously done probably with adults and kind of transfer it to, to studying kids. So what we decided to focus on is a very different question from what I had been doing previously. And the more I look at it, the more different I know that it is. Um, and this was the idea of learning new words from linguistic context. So if you see this sentence, like yet again, her professor is bloviating about the importance of semantics. So if you don't know the I didn't know the meaning of the word phobiating, but if you don't know the meaning of the word, how do you figure it out from this? Like first, can you? Can you figure out the meaning of the word? All right, what do you guys, what does it mean? Rambling, yeah, it's kind of rambling. It's being really verbose. I looked it up. Um, so, so bloviating, and there's a couple cues you can use to figure this out, right? One is, if you know the meaning of the other words in there, and you can understand what type of context this would be in, right? So that professors are people that sometimes ramble, right? And talk a lot about things. 
Um, there's also stuff in the word bloviating. It sounds like bloated. So if you know words that sound similar that may have similar roots, you might be able to figure out the meaning of the word. So it turns out that this learning from linguistic context is really, um, this became the question that we had. What happens when kids are learning from linguistic context, not from this idea of world to word mapping? Um, it actually turns out there is very, very, very little research on this. So to actually take a situation, my background in word learning with young kids is massive. The back of the research in this, not my background, but the research in this area. <laughs> you <have> amazing. <laughs> the research in this area is is really massive. There's there's tons of research looking at exactly what cues kids are using, how they're using them, how they change over time. And it seems like once kids reach about the age of six, they're just done. Like researchers just aren't that interested in it. You do see research in this looking in the education literature. So how are kids learning when when they're in a classroom setting? Um, but they ask very different questions in education. Like they rarely separate nouns from verbs. They rarely do the more kind of systematic study that we would necessarily do of like, if I, if I change the context just based on these two items, what would happen if I do it this way? So, so there's very different questions that are asked. There's also within, I'm having trouble conveying to some of the language researchers how unique this is because there is this thing called learning from, um, or incidental learning in young kids which is that kids just overhear the meaning of the word, but in pretty much every situation that I've found of that, the object or action is still in the environment. It's not that they still have to take just their linguistic information and maybe attach it onto a completely unavailable concept that was previously not there and needs to be created. And that's what we really do with learning from linguistic context. So it's a very different process um, and not as well researched. So some of the background that we found on this is that it is definitely incredibly important. This is how, from the time you get into first grade through college, this is really how you learn most of your vocabulary. So the bulk of our vocabulary as adults, and really even later in grade school, mid-grade school and beyond, is learning from linguistic context, not from word-to-world -world mapping. Um, we also know that vocabulary is a major predictor of academic success. The better you are at learning words, the better you're going to do in your science class, your math class, your English class. It permeates everything in academic success. And shockingly, there's very little research on actual vocabulary learning in these older kids. Um, the other thing is that kids are actually horrible at this, and they're incredibly variable. So, if you just take one word that the child is just seeing for the first time in context, where you're not trying to give them information, you're not putting in a definition, it's just in a general context when they might see that word, they rarely will learn the meaning of it. This is also true if you're not gonna, if they aren't expecting you to ask the meaning of it afterwards, right? So if they're in a classroom, it's a bolded word with a definition, they can learn it. But if they're just reading for fun and they see one word once, they actually very rarely seem to acquire the, that word meaning. Um, so, wait, that was the end of it. Yeah, so, so this is why to us, this was a really interesting question. It was one easier to do in terms of EEG, or we thought it would be. But it's also a pretty under-researched area that seems like it has a lot of important implications for how kids are learning information. Mandy, can I ask something real quick? On that sure. last example you gave, what, you mean if they're reading along and there's a definition given, or they have to extract No, then it, so they can do it. They do much better with the definition. What's interesting, though, is there has been this movement away in education from actually teaching definitions. Rote memorization of definitions is now something they rarely do in grade school and middle school, and they start it again when they start prepping kids for SAT. So this is, hearing a definition is actually a way kids can learn the words pretty quickly. It's not the way we learn a lot of our vocabulary, and even within the schools now, they're kind of moving away from that as a way of teaching. They're doing this more, give the word in lots and lots of different contexts, and they'll figure out the meaning of it. Oh, so that's the way they try to teach vocabulary a lot more now. And that doesn't work. It, well, yeah, that's we're finding it doesn't work. It, it's really, kids aren't nearly as good as it as we would expect them to be. And there's this idea that, well, kids, you know, five-year-olds learn from incidental learning, but this isn't the same. And, and kids are pretty bad at it. Thank you. But definitions would be the ideal way of doing it. Um, so our initial question looking at this is, does the brain actually differ in how you're acquiring nouns and verbs? This was the general question. If we give you a learning from context situation, are we going to see differences in nouns and verbs? And can that tell us something about the strategies that people are using when they're learning these different words? 
And then the related questions we had is, how would this change with development? My interest, which I'll get to a little bit more in what our grant was on, is how does this change based on your environment? So children who are raised in poverty, turns out, are, have smaller vocabularies and are actually much worse at this. And why is that the case? Um, and there's, there's a bunch of background on that. And then the question that, that Allison obviously had is eventually, what, how, does, how do we see differences in language disorders? So we created this study, and I say we with me like watching Allison do most of the work on it and answering <laughs> questions. So it was based on a lot of previous, or not a lot, but about three different previous studies with adults. Um, and what they did, and these were EEG studies, and what they did is they looked at the N400. The N400 is a negative going response. It's very large when you hear a word you don't know the meaning to. And what they found is as you learn the meaning of the word, it attenuates and becomes smaller to the point where it looks like a real word. So that they can start to see kind of over time that shift of word learning based on how the N400 attenuates. So the idea is that we would look at the N400, um, how quickly it attenuates, as well as maybe the distribution. Is it found in different areas of the scalp? Do we see it in, in which case different areas of the brain are probably engaged? Um, so the way that these studies were done before and the way that we created this was that for you want to give a few sentences that have this novel word in it. And you need to, obviously sentences can vary in how much context they provide for learning the meaning of the word. So the way this had been done in the past, this, the, at least following one of the studies we were following, is you started with a sentence that was pretty vague and didn't really limit the meaning of the word and then moved into a much more specific um, sentence that by the end of it you should know the meaning of the word. This is called closed probability. It's how predictable that last word is based on the preceding information. And we just put the novel word at the end. So Allison, along with some of the undergraduate students in the lab, created hundreds and hundreds of different sentences. Um, and then what we did is we asked undergraduate students to fill in the last word. So for example, if we said, our teacher tells us where to blank. What do you think it is? Sit. Yes. You may have seen it before. That one's, that one's sit. How about this one? To eat cereal, you need a spoon, right? That one's easier. Um, he got tired of studying and decided to sleep. Sleep. This one is sleep. But there are many options, right? It could be a lot of different things in that case. And I get candy when I'm good at the chores. That would be a good answer. This one's doctor. So. Oh. Ah, right. So what happened is with any one given sentence, it might be really hard to figure out the meaning of the word. But as you go across sentences, it should become easier. You need to integrate all of the information that you're hearing. So from me is what they created were triplets that moved from really low constraint to high constraint. So for example, the noun one would start out as something like, at lunch she didn't eat her dax. And you know it's food, but you have no idea necessarily what food it is. And then by the end, we use a pretty clear reference like Snow White, and Snow White snacked on the Dax, then what do you think Dax is? Apple. That's an apple, right? So across those three, that should really help. Um, the verb example, I wasn't supposed to, but I wanted to blick, and then it moves up to her outfit was crazy and caused everybody to blick. What do you think the answer is there? Laugh. Laugh is a good one. Sta look was what we were going for. And what happens with these is if people, um, give a wrong response that still fits in with all three sentences, it's counted as correct. So they don't have to necessarily give ours, but if you go through and you can see, be like, all right, I can see why you picked that, um, then those were counted as correct. But So these are the sentences we made. Um, there are 21 sets of four conditions. So we had a meaning plus, meaning that it created meaning. So you, across the three sentences, there was meaning. That for nouns and verbs. And then we also had one to control for just repetition of the words. So we put a, a word at the end of three sentences that were all low probability sentences and actually came from different words. So there was no way you could come up with what a word is for this. And that way we made sure that we weren't just getting changes in the brain due to hearing a novel word multiple times. It was actually adding meaning to this word that changed the brain response. Um, we also had 42 real words, which was kind of a control. The idea is when does the N400 look like the real word? Um, <coughs> okay, so. Some of the data we have are participants. <coughs> in this case, I'm going to be showing data from 28 adults, um, and they're all undergraduates here at UTD. I think they're native English. They're native English speakers. They may be bilingual, but they're native English speakers. Um, we also have pilot data from the kids, and I'm going to show you the behavioral data from all of these different age groups, but the EEG data just from a group that we have a large sample in, which is 13 to 14 year olds. 
Um, our first question in general is, is it harder to learn verbs in this case than it is to learn nouns? So we know that that's true across the board when we do word-to-world word -word mapping, that identifying an action in your environment is harder than identifying an object. So is it also just as hard to do this when you're learning from linguistic context, or does the fact that you don't need to find the referent make kind of equal the playing field? So these two word classes are now equal. Um, the second question is whether we would see an attenuation of the M400 as you're learning the word, and if it's the same or different in nouns compared to verbs. And then we want to see how these change with development. So to answer the first question, we start to look at the behavioral results with the adults. And they were actually what I would consider to be very bad at this. So with the nouns, if you think of the close probability, by the last sentence, the close probability was 80 to 100%, with a lot of them being closer to 90%. So if you just had to fill in the blank on just that last sentence, you were at 90%. But when you had to figure out the meaning of the word across three, they were at 82. This actually gets worse with verbs, even though our close probability for the verbs was identical to our nouns. So they are actually worse, and statistically, they are worse at verbs than nouns. Um, then the meaning minus was a harder condition, and we, we figured this would be the case. It's really hard for people to say they don't know the answer to something. They're really hesitant to do that. So in the meaning minus, so basically, I don't think I said how they respond. <laughs> so you hear these three sentences while you're having the EEG recorded, and then a signal comes up that you can give a response. We have an experimenter sitting with the person who takes down what they say the word means. And they do some practice tests, so they know that there is also the option to say there is no meaning to this word. But as I said, that's kind of harder for the students to do. Um, when they get it wrong, what they tend to do is latch onto one sentence and find a word that fits into that one sentence but doesn't fit across all three. So they're not really performing the task. Um, so that's what we were getting. So my thoughts were adults were awful. Um, they actually initially were worse than this. When our first pilot sample of these, of these adults were at like 70% in the nouns and worse in the verbs. Um, we actually, they were worse at the verbs than the nouns, which was what we expected. We actually did a test on this and found part of the problem was the order in which we put the sentences. That starting with a really vague sentence and moving to a really specific one was actually more difficult, especially for the verbs, than just giving the specific sentence. In fact, giving one sentence that was just really specific was much easier than starting vague and then having to limit all of the options that were available to you. Um, that didn't change our study, though, because we were already collecting data. So that was good to know, but it doesn't matter to the EG data. OK, so then we want to look at the ERPs. And I realize these don't come out very well. Um, but this is our N400, and what we do find is exactly what we would expect. You get this really nice attenuation of the N400. I had a clicker. There we go. Um, I'm not supposed to move, so. OK. Anyway, so the first presentation, you have a really large N400, and as you move up, it's smaller, and as you get to the third, it's smaller. So there was an attenuation when you were learning the word. When they were not learning the word, there wasn't an attenuation. These are a little messy because the picture itself isn't baseline corrected. But basically, it goes first word, second word, third word, with no significant differences between them. So there's just not a lot of consistency. It was a real mess, which is kind of what we expected. When there is no word meaning, you don't show the attenuation. When This was for nouns. So nouns worked that way. When we moved to verbs, so that was our noun meaning minus. When we moved to verbs, it was actually a total mess, even when they figured out the meaning of the word. So there was no attenuation of the N400. It does the same thing that we get in the meaning minus, where it jumps around, but actually the, the scale here is a little different. So these are really close to each other. That doesn't make any sense based on the previous literature. So, But all the previous literature is on nouns. None of these other studies were done with verbs. And what you would expect is if they came up with a meaning for the word, there should be attenuation. And they did, and there is an attenuation. So what we kind of, the decision from this was um, now show what we expect, verbs don't, and it's not very clear at this point why. Um, so our decision moving forward was to just drop the verbs. So it <laughs> turns out yeah. verbs are hard. Verbs are really hard. And it may be that people are using a very different strategy. We look, though, I mean, it's not like this N400 is showing up in a different distribution, which is what we would think. Maybe it's in a different area of the cortex that people are kind of grasping this information. And it's not there. So 
really the move forward was the idea that maybe like what they did in world toward mapping, we need to figure out what's happening with nouns. And then we'll worry about having a really strong foundation in that and then worry about verbs. Um, we're still collecting the information on the verbs for some of this stuff. And, the, and the, with the adults we are, we're trying to get a much larger sample so that we can get a better idea of what's happening. But moving forward with the kids, we're going to just drop the verbs because it, they're, yeah, it's not working. <laughs> we need to stay focused. Um, the other question then was, are there developmental differences in this kind of learning effect and are there differences in the N400? And these are the developmental differences that we see. So there's a clear developmental pattern that you see starting with eight-year-olds and moving up through 16-year-olds and adults. And in fact, our 16-year-olds, we had a couple get 100. We've had a couple kids get 100. I don't know that we've had any college students get 100. So, um, well, so we also, there are a couple age groups where you see kind of like, yeah, the, the number there is also your N. So this is pilot data. So we don't have a huge sample. This is also, we started collecting data starting to look at differences based on being raised in poverty, and the variation in these groups is really large. So we have some kids in, in very, very low income homes, and some in higher income homes, and based on the schools and things, where we purposely had looked for high variability in the population. And so it's coming out now that we don't have much data. I think as we get more data, we'll start to tease some of this apart. But yeah, there are some like dips in it. And the fact that the 16-year-olds are better than the college students, and I mean the 12-year-olds are better than the 13-year-olds, there's some, there's some stuff still going on there. But, um, but in general, we see a progression. We see across the board that kids are better at nouns than verbs, which is also what we kind of expected from this. Um, the meaning minus shows what it does in adults. They are worse at that than they are at meaning plus, and you see also they're actually worse at the verb version of that than the noun version of that. So we do see developmental differences. We also, in the 13 to 14 year olds, see a clear attenuation of the N400. So this is first presentation, second, and third, and it looks a lot like a real word by the time it gets to the third presentation. So we, we were getting the same, this is for nouns, again, <laughs> verbs are awful. So we, we kind of see what's happening within the nouns. You don't get it for the meaning minus, so we start to see that change. Um, What's interesting though is, so across the ages we see developmental differences. When you actually look at this age group, these are 13 to 14 year olds, they're behaviorally the same as our adults. And within the ERPs we see really similar effects of this attenuation. So we submitted this as pilot data for a grant where we wanted to look at differences in poverty. And I'm probably not going to go through the poverty aspects of it. Um, my interest was in socioeconomic status and how that impacts word learning. There's a lot of studies showing that there are vocabulary differences between kids who are um, from lower SES homes and higher SES homes, that these differences continue to grow as they go through school. Um, and we know that there are differences in the home environment that lead to this, starting when the kids are really young. There actually is very little research on whether their ability to learn words is different. And this, there's high variability across the board, so the question is, does this apply then, do you have the fourth graders, if you're at a lower, if you have less information coming into the classroom, is that gonna impact your ability to use that information to learn a new word? And if that's the case, it's not just vocabulary, it's actually word, it's the process of learning words and building your vocabulary that differs. So that was our question, and I'm not gonna go through the theories of it, but um, basically we sent all this data in as pilot data. And our question was, um, what we wanted to look at is, can we see how much are their brain function differences in SES? And I actually didn't expect there to be many. There have been these new theories that show that being raised in poverty may have strong impacts on the brain and that that may be part of the problem. Um, but I think this has more to do with process, not necessarily overall brain structure. So um, our first question was just kind of, are there behavioral differences in word learning based on SES? Um, are there differences in known words? And then we actually created two tasks, the learning from context task, and then one that's more like your word to world mapping. And the idea was that there wouldn't be differences there and there would in the learning from context because basic word learning should be the same, but as it becomes more difficult, you might see differences. You don't have to worry about that much because the reviewers absolutely hated our other study, so we kind of dropped that. Um, so the, the feedback on the grant was, they, they really didn't like this study where we expected no differences, which makes you're not supposed to expect no differences. Um, and the, the processing of known words wasn't all that informative. So <coughs> basically, the, the one question we had is, do we have differences based on SES? And I realized this was a smaller sample 
right before I came to give this talk, but we do start to see SES differences, that children who are from lower SES homes, this is the learning from context test, and these are the ones where we have the same age groups and compare them, they do seem to do worse. And what's really important to keep in mind here is the sentences that we use all have vocabulary that a three-year-old has in their vo vo productive vocabulary. So the problem here isn't that they don't know the words in the sentence. They know all of the words in the sentences. But kids are having a harder time using that information to figure out the meaning of the new word. So it's not just knowing the information, it's integrating that information in a meaningful way. Does that make sense? So, so this was our pilot data for that. And overall, the grant did pretty well, but they gave us a really important component back. One was to drop fast mapping. We did that. Um, the other is that the N400 doesn't actually tell us much. If we're just looking at how the N400 changes and becomes smaller, we don't know why. It just becomes smaller. And we were interested in the rate and maybe the distribution, but really between our 13 and 14 year olds and our adults, we weren't seeing any differences at all. Um, and so the question was, is there a better way to use this information to learn more about the underlying processes? And, and because we were only looking at the N400, it didn't really inform theory, right? We weren't figuring out what kids were doing or not doing when they weren't doing well or were doing well. So we made some changes and have resubmitted this. And the recent, so the study itself has stayed the same. We're just analyzing it differently. Um, the, uh, and it, so we're now going to look at time frequency analysis. And I'm going to kind of go through that and where our data are there. And it actually turns out to be much, much, much more informative. So the reviewers were right. And hopefully now they'll give me money. So <laughs> say, look, you're right. Can I have some money? Um, so so we're, we're kind of, um, the, the, the pilot data here were pretty nice in the end of this. So we removed that task. We created our own model, but I'm also not going to go through that. And then we start to look through the time frequency. That's the model. Don't worry about it. Um, so if you, if you know how we get EEG, right, or ERPs, I'm just going to go through this. and I glossed over it with the ERPs, but we have people performing tasks and they have stimuli that they have multiple exposures to and we're recording the raw EEG. The way that you um, calculate an ERP from that is to take you know, each instance of hearing the dog, each event where they heard like a word dog, you average it together and you get an average waveform. And then you compare that to say each time you hear the word cat and you see how these are different and that tells you information about how quickly they identify that these are different words, things like that. What you do with time, and that's how we were looking at the N400. Um, and we were always looking at that last word you were learning the meaning of. How does that change over time? What you do with time frequency analysis, and I stole these from Julie's old lecture, so if you guys were at the one where Julie gave last year, this will all look familiar. Um, what we can do with the raw EEG data is actually decompose the signal into the underlying signals that occur underneath it. So within this frequency that's been recorded, there's actually changes within the beta frequency, alpha frequency, and theta frequency. And the, the belief is that this is how neurons are actually talking to each other, right? They're, they're communicating through different frequencies. And if we can see changes in those frequencies, we can actually start to tease apart the types of communication that are occurring. This is still pretty new research, so the um, general idea, and these are the, the, the implications that matter to our study, but there are others that could be happening. When you see beta changes, this is sometimes associated with what we would consider word retrieval. And this comes from studies actually that I've done previously with John Hart, where he has patients do things like you hear two words that associate together to create a third word. So if you hear the word um, desert and humps, what does that make you think of? Camel. Camel, right? And it doesn't take either individual word, but together it helps you come up with this other word. So when people come up with that last word, what he finds is this big increase in the beta response. And, and that this retrieving that meaning to that word and identifying it gives you a beta response. Um, alpha change is related to attention. So this is what you see. It's actually opposite of what the other frequencies are that we're going to talk about. It actually goes down when you pay attention to something. And if you've learned about alpha in the past, you know that it, it goes up when you sleep. right? Alpha, people think about alpha with sleep. So when you totally zone out, your brain seems to just go into this alpha wave. When you stop zoning out, it 
decreases in alpha. And it actually does that in different areas. So if you're doing a visual task, you see lower alpha in, audit in occipital areas compared to an auditory task. EEG isn't great at localizing, but it can do pretty well at general localizing. Um, and then theta is known to be semantic integration. So if you're taking information and integrating it, this is actually what seems to underlie the traditional N400. So anytime you have two words and they go together and you notice they go together or don't go together, there's a change in theta. So these were the, the, in the frequencies that we were interested in. The idea was instead of looking at the ERP, we're going to look for changes in alpha, theta, and beta as people learn words. And the question is, how well do they use engaged theta, which would mean taking the information and semantically integrating it, so taking that whole sentence and integrating it into this new word. How much are they actively engaging and kind of um, paying attention to the task, really, would be an alpha change. So are they really engaging this well? And then the beta synchrony would be, when do they identify the meaning of the word, in theory. So this is all, I'm going to show you the data. This is how we're interpreting it. If you hate it, just let me know, but I'm, I'm okay with that. This is our early stages of it. So our question was developmentally, which is all I'm going to show you now, and then it would be related to FCS. Are there differences in the timing of these engagements? Interested in the topography, so the areas of the brain that are engaged. And interested in differences in the consistency. So and that one was especially true for alpha. Can you actually keep paying attention to something when you need to, to learn the meaning of a word? Um, so here are the results in children and adults, and I'm going to... Hopefully make this all make sense. So first we're looking at the first presentation, the second, and the third. And I'm going to show you across all the frequencies in one electrode, but then we're going to break it down by areas. So just to show you kind of the type of data that we get. <coughs> so in the adults, this is FCZ, which is kind of a frontal electrode. You can see how these changes. So this is, keep going back and forth. Presentation one, two, and three of this novel word at the end of the sentence. And this is statistical differences across these presentations in terms of time and the frequency that you actually see that. So this is zero to 1,000 milliseconds. So this is the theta frequency. And again, we expected increases. The increases are compared to baseline. So once you hear the word, how does that change? This is the alpha frequency. The blue means a decrease within it. Green is nothing. And then the beta frequency. And one of the things that becomes hard when you put it all on one um, graph, which is why I'm going to pull them apart, is these slower frequencies are actually larger in amplitude. Mm. So if I put it all in one graph, it looks like nothing's going on here, but you have all these significant effects, right? So I'm going to tease these out so you can see what's happening, because these are just made smaller by putting them all on one figure. So, and this is also just one electrode, and we really want to look at the location of these effects. So what we can do is say, okay, within the frequency we're interested in, in the first case is going to be theta, which is 4 to 8 hertz, and the time period we're interested in, and in this case we're focusing on when the N400 is. So 250 milliseconds to 450 milliseconds after you hear the new word. Where do we see changes in the brain? And to figure out that, we can make these kind of head maps. So on the first presentation for theta, we see increases in frontal areas, mainly frontal areas for the second presentation. And the third, you get it, but it actually kind of starts to spread. And then this is which electrode shows statistical difference in these three presentations. Does that make sense so far? Okay. Well, Julie, it has to be you. You do this. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not, that is good to know, though. That's good. Um, so, so then we can see the distribution across. And the most noticeable thing in this is actually what they find with um, MRI studies as well when they look at semantic processing, is that children engage a much wider range of the brain when they're doing this. So when they're trying to identify the meaning of the word, keep moving. <laughs> okay. when they're trying to identify the meaning of the word, what you get is children using a lot more of their brain. The next question is kind of what differences do we see across here? And what we can do is take these electrodes where there are significant differences and now look at those spectrograms that I showed before. And what you see is, say, in CZ around here, the adults show a theta burst, a theta burst, and in the third trial, they actually show a really large theta burst. And we see that that's significant across those trials. Kids show this, but you actually don't see it being significant. And I think part of that is there's a lot of variability in here. Um, there's also a difference in the timing. And you see it, this is across age groups going this way. And this is what's significant. And then interactions. Um, this difference in timing, I think, is actually going to come out once we have more subjects. And it's opposite of what you might expect. You usually think kids take longer to do something. What we're seeing here is adults kind of keep this prolonged theta activation after they hear the word. 
And I think that's really important to figuring out the meaning of the word. The new word comes in, and instead of just being like, yep, that was the word, you have to start building that context and figure out what the word means. So what we see for adults is across this whole thousand milliseconds, you have this increased theta, and for the kids, it really drops off except for in that last trial. Does that make sense? We also see differences where it's a lot larger in kids, and kids seem to still be engaging, like I said, a much broader distribution of the brain. So like we see here, instead of just having very frontal activity for this, we're getting a broad distribution where you see across the board these differences, and if you look at adults, you don't see theta differences really here, and in kids, you really see that they're engaging massive amounts of theta throughout this across the whole scale. Make sense? So across this, we have these differences in distribution then, um, as well as prolonged engagement with the adults in theta. So if this is semantic integration, which is what we think it is and what previous studies have shown, then this is really showing differences in how you're engaging that semantic memory to figure out what the word means. And this is actually just 13 and 14 year olds. So again, these kids are performing about as well as the adults, but the way they're doing it is somewhat different in terms of how their brains engage. Um, obviously, I didn't do very well in having these come up one at a time, but <laughs> this is looking now at the same way, but looking at alpha. And the idea with alpha, the way we're interpreting this and what I'm going to focus on, on here is the desynchrony that you see in alpha, or changes in desynchrony. We actually don't get, and this one's a little bit less, this one's a little bit more variable, but what's interesting is actually in adults, there are no significant differences in alpha across trials. They actually engage alpha consistently the whole time, and so you have these big bursts of alpha desynchrony, which means my brain should be working really hard on this, and it's doing it consistently throughout the trials. In kids, you show you get these spatterings of differences in the alpha, and we really think that shows that they're just not as, as able to continually engage the way that they need to, to perform this test. They're obviously still doing really well, but this seems to be something they're not doing as well at with this active engagement. And then across ages, we start to see some differences as well as interactions. The last one then is beta. And unfortunately, I don't have the kid head, kid's head map for this. This is a technical error this morning. So we have the adult data, and actually what we see in kids is something a little bit different, but actually it's very different, but I'll show you in the spectrogram. Um, the adults show this massive burst of beta that happens in the second trial. Mm -hmm. And when we look at the spectrogram, it's really noticeable. So they're not that noticeable. It's two, there's like, bam, tons of beta, and then you really don't see it in three. And you get these significant differences. For kids, you see that more in three. And we actually think this is what we had hoped it was, which is retrieval of the word meaning. That even though kids and adults are performing equally as well after the third trial, it may take kids all three trials and adults might be doing it in the second trial. Does that make sense? So we get this huge interaction between the two age groups because two is where the adults are kind of getting this data burst and three is where the kids are. Um, so that's our, once we kind of moved, like I said, the, the idea was to take the same types of information instead of just saying, hey, the N400 attenuates or it doesn't, figure out exactly what's underlying these changes. And I think from doing this, we really are able to. So the EEG data that I gave you there is kids who are doing equally as well as adults um, once we look after the third trial. <laughs> but the neural engagement shows a, a pretty interesting pattern. For the most part, it's actually really similar. We see increases in beta, we see decreases in alpha, we see increases in beta. They seem to mean the same types of things if we're interpreting them correctly. But there are differences in the timing, consistency, and distribution, which is what we would expect, and what we would expect to account for individual differences as we kind of move forward. Um, so again, if semantic integration is what is theta, then we're using a broader distribution, less prolonged activity in kids. Attention in kids seem to be a little bit more variable. And then the word retrieval seems to actually happen at a different point in the two different groups. Um, the idea then is if we know this in kids, can we now, given that we have a lot more information, if we get a much larger sample of kids and start to look at different kids from different SES backgrounds, as well as kids who just in general do well at this and do poorly at this, which is another way that we're, we're kind of tackling the question, and then question of kids with SLI or other problems, can we start to see differences in the overall brain pattern that help to explain why we have those differences? So is there a difference between the kid who just can't keep their attention on the task and what they need to do is learn how to focus on the right things compared to a kid who needs better information about semantic integration? Like 
how do I use the semantic information that was there previously to figure out the meaning of this word? Um, so there might actually be different strategies that the kids could be taught based on this if we can figure this out. And someday we'll get to verbs, and that was, but <laughs> like, maybe eventually we'll start on verbs again. Um, but that was, that's kind of the progression. So overall I think the NSF reviewers were, were good, and hopefully they'll let us continue this on. So, oh, I didn't mean to make that said bigger, but that was, that's all I have for today. So, thank you.